All right, my friends. I just pressed the let's go live button, which means we've got to wait for the stream to fire up all across the fruited plain of the internets before we go ahead and get started. We like to make sure the tubes are working. Sometimes the tubes are not working. It has happened before where I've just pressed it and then sat here uh, talking into oblivion. But it looks like it's working. That's tremendous news. That means we can go ahead and get started. So let's do it, shall we? Hello, my friends, and welcome back to yet another episode of Watching the Watchers Live, the show that spotlights misconduct involving police, prosecutors, and politicians. My name is Robert Govea. I am a criminal defense attorney, and today we're talking about the Alvin Bragg trial. We got some trial prep that we're going to get into today, and I've got something a little bit different for us. I've got some slides that I've been working on to aggregate and consolidate all of the various concepts from this trial because this has been a long saga going all the way back to 2016, a number of different prosecutors, bizarre set of charges, new novel legal theories. We've got corruption through and through, questionable judge, questionable judge's daughter. We've got questionable prosecutors. We got a lot going on. So we got some slides we're gonna attend to and we're gonna try to answer these questions today and then we'll jump into some more substantive stuff ideally tomorrow, talking about Stormy Daniels, Michael Cohen, some of the other potential witnesses like Karen McDougal, David Pecker, and others. But questions today we're concerned with is, who are the prosecutors? You can see there's a bunch of people who were involved. You've heard the names Matthew Colangelo. You've heard the name Cyrus Vance. Who are these people? We all know who Alvin Bragg is, but who are the brains behind the operation? Because Alvin certainly is not, basically just a placeholder individual who's there not doing much of anything. Well, ask ourselves and refresh our recollections about what these specific charges are. They are 34 counts of the same charge, but for a number of different elements of the transaction. There was an invoice, a ledger, and then there was an actual payment via a check. And so we'll talk about each one of those. We'll understand how Alvin Bragg is gonna attempt to prove the felony elements of this case. Because we're asking ourselves, wait, if this is from 2016, 2017 payments, well, didn't the statute of limitations expire if these were all misdemeanors? Well, Alvin turned them into felonies in order to extend that statute of limitations. And a big common question is, how is he able to do that? So we'll talk about some theories and then see how that might work once the trial unfolds. And then we're going to dive in a little bit more to Judge Mercon's daughter issue and see what is going on there because there's been a lot of back and forth on trying to get the judge to recuse himself based on the fact that his daughter works for Joe Biden. Kind of a bit of a bias there. So we're gonna go through some slides and see what is inside as it relates to the Bragg trial. Trial is starting on Monday with jury selection. We're gonna be here. It's gonna be pretty intense, I believe. You know, I think that they're gonna keep this thing going unless something happens. We're starting on Monday, so thanks for subscribing and thanks for inviting someone you know or love over here to tell them, hey, this is the place where we are covering it because we're going to get into it. Then we're going to turn over to our friend Good Logic in the house. Good Logic filed his Article 78 petition to get Trump ungagged so that Trump can actually speak about this case, communicate about the justice system during an election where a key issue happens to be the justice system. And so he filed his petition. It is now on the public docket and he sent it over uh, so that we could be the first to review it fresh out of the oven, baby. And so we love to support our fellow uh, journos and YouTube and LaTuber American fighters out there. And so we're going to talk about it. We'll see what's inside and read through it and the, then support Joe. And of course, we linked Joe's channel in our description, so be sure you are supporting him and following him because he's a journalist on the ground, boots on the ground in New York, and I'm sure he's going to be all over the place like mad next week as well. So we'll take a look at it. Now, all right, uh, all of that is coming up. Now, this morning, we had a great members-only stream. We love hanging out with our membos. We have our membos at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. This morning, we were talking about Joe Biden, Donald Trump, 
the election, right? The polls are now like closing all of a sudden. Joe Biden is inching closer with Donald Trump. We're asking ourselves why that is. Is it abortion? Is it the Arizona, you know, uh, explosion that's happening? Is it uh, the, the Joe Biden reversal on Palestine? What's going on, right? So we're talking about that. We're talking about Trump, the campaigning, Trump's Chick-fil-A visit and all sorts of fun stuff. We have great streams in the morning, a little bit more casual here. We're able to talk about other stuff that we can't get to here on the show. And so we'd love to have you. It's a great way to support us. It's a great way to meet other people in the Watcher community, have some fun, get some extra content, and you can participate as well. Drop your own stories and your own comments. So come check it out, watchingthewatchers.locals.com, links down below. robertgovea.com is also the website where we upload our PDFs, where we upload our newsletter. You can sign up for our newsletter there. We have our merch store and we have the show calendar. So I know notifications can be a problem out there. Sometimes people have difficulties with those. So you can just go to our website, add the calendar to your phone, and that way it'll just pop up just like a regular calendar event on your phone. Hey, I got a meeting. Oh, who's this one with? Oh, yes. My favorite meeting of the day, watching the watchers live at 6 p.m. Eastern time. So you can add the calendar right from our website and that way you don't miss it. And of course, this weekend on Saturday, we've got our Watcher Lodge Sovereignty Saturday event, which we're doing now every Saturday. And let me share with you, I just posted the seedlings are in the ground. So we are now embarking on a home garden extravaganza. And so here you can take a look. We got some seedlings in the ground. Those are yours truly's uh, seedlings down there. We got a bunch of stuff in there, rosemary, oregano. We got squash, lots of stuff. So go check that one out, watcherlodge.com. Seedlings are in the dirt. We also have some good stories about other warnings, you know, FBI's warning about a terror attack. We've got nuclear Armageddon, secret bunkers for Congress, social collapse in the age of AI, all of that in our news and alerts segment at watcherlodge.com. And then click the calendar button and then register, come sign up for Sovereignty Saturday. It's all free and it's a lot of fun. And we are excited to create some good energy around this stuff. Also, the shirts, baby. Travis Matthew Polo shirts. You can grab yours at Nordstrom's Nordstrom Rack. We have Walmart even has them now. So they're all in our shopping tab. You can grab a good, nice new shirt and look good while you're watching the show and look good elsewhere as well. And ladies too, you can just click over, follow our link, fill your shopping cart up and treat yourself to something nice. And thanks for supporting the show by doing that. So with all of that said, my friends, thank you for supporting us any which way you can. Let's get right into it and talk about the Alvin Bragg case. And we've got slides to attend to here. Whew. And you can see, this is a little bit of a rough draft, okay? I was kind of skidding in here at the, uh, at the show, trying to get all this done. We'll see if the animations work. But I wanted to consolidate all of our ideas into one slide deck so that our communications could be a little tighter when we are debating all of this stuff in the arena of ideas. And so let's get to it. <clears throat> the Stormy Cohen prosecution brought by Alvin Bragg. We're gonna learn everything we need to know about what's happening here. We're gonna go through this quickly so we can get up to speed and be prepared for the trial. We know the star witness in this entire case is going to be Michael Cohen, who is someone who is a convicted perjurer, as we are going to learn. He is a critical part of this case. We also have Stormy Daniels. You know her and what her profession is, and she's gonna be someone who's the subject of the contract that is at issue or of the payments that were at issue in this trial. And all of this is being led by, of course, Alvin Bragg. And so we're gonna start with Alvin Bragg and learn a little bit more about him because Bragg is kind of just the figurehead. They kind of just shoved him out in here. He just got elected, took office in 2021, and now he's gotta be in charge of this case, which they're accelerating because it's the last case in their arsenal that they have to go against Trump. They're running out of time in Florida. They are out of time on the J6 case. We'll see what the Supreme Court does there. And Fannie is in a lot of hot water still. So that case looks like it's going to be off the rails before November. So this is it. This is the only thing they have left. So let's talk about Alvin Bragg. Who is this guy? Well, you can see Alvin Bragg. He went to Harvard Law and he was on Harvard Law Review. And so it'd be very curious, I think, if someone did one of their 
little, um, you know, analyses on Alvin Bragg to see if all of his law review articles were appropriately cited, you know, because he was on law review, he may have written a lot of articles and we know what kind of reputation Harvard has. So he was there on Harvard Law Review, citations needed on his work. 2003, he went to work for Attorney General Elliot Spitzer. And we know what happened to him. Then in 2009, he went to become a U.S. attorney at the Southern District of New York, also in New York. We've covered a lot of cases there. That was the Lawrence uh, Kaplan case, also pre presiding over a, a Trump case in E. Jean Carroll. 2017, Bragg went over to the deputy AG's office in New York. He was suing Trump back then. So the reason we ask about prosecutors is because we want to know, are they unbiased? Are they partisan? or nonpartisan? Are they prosecutorial hacks or not? So we're going to see, going all the way back to 2017, before he was the DA of Manhattan, he was already going after Trump, right? So has a history of doing that. Then in 2021, he gets elected, takes office January, boom, he becomes the Manhattan DA. Now you've heard about Alvin Bragg, and you probably heard this idea that he is a Soros DA. Well, I would say that that is fact check true. Now you'll see other people will say, no, not really. He just got money from Soros and he's not just a Soros guy, but you can follow the money. And you can see here, George Soros gave a million dollars. This is from a New York Times article. George Soros, 1 million to a racial justice organization called the Color of Change. And then they gave $500,000 of that over to Alvin Bragg. And I believe that that money was actually earmarked in totality for Alvin Bragg, but they decided, well, we're an independent entity. So they just grifted their 500 grand off the top or whatever they did with the rest of it. But George Soros funding a lot of this stuff. And then this enabled Bragg to take office in 2021 and then have some issues with this case, right? The Trump prosecution that we're talking about here emanates from 2017 charges. So from a long time ago, and Bragg doesn't take office as the Manhattan DA until 2021 as we saw. So what happened to this case before it actually landed with Alvin Bragg? Well, we have an idea because before Bragg took office, you can see this date is July 18th, 2019. So this is before Bragg is in charge. We still have another prosecutor who's in the Manhattan DA's office. That other prosecutor who is not this guy is Cyrus Vance, who we're going to learn about next. But we're rewinding the clock. We're going to pre-Bragg, right? Where was this case before we even got here? So Bragg, not in office yet, but this is now kicking around with the federal government. So this guy's name is Jeffrey Berman. Jeffrey Berman, you can see former U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York. And more about this guy. He was the U.S. attorney in 2019, he was actually appointed by Jeff Sessions. So some background on him. Appointed by Jeff Sessions back in 2018. There was a problem with him. Bill Barr said that he needed to go. In June 2020, he was ultimately fired and he was removed. So this guy was a little bit uh, you know, difficult for the Trump administration. So it seems he would not leave. And so they asked him to leave and then he got and then he was uh, then he did leave. So here is what they tell us, though, back in 2019. He is with the feds there in the Southern District of New York. Right now, Trump is being prosecuted by the states, right, by the, the, the state of New York through Alvin Bragg. But we're asking ourselves, well, if Donald Trump is alleged to have given Stormy Daniels some money and that money was an, an illegal transfer or, you know, it was, it was maneuvered through LLCs and through Stormy Daniels, through Michael Cohen's to Stormy Daniels, then that is a violation of federal election rules and whatever. So, okay. The feds should investigate that, right? We have a U.S. attorney called Jeffrey Berman who is doing exactly that. Here's what the New York Times reported. In 2019, they said, federal prosecutors signaled in a court document that was released on Thursday that it was unlikely that they would file additional charges in the so-called hush money investigation that ensnared members of Donald Trump's inner circle and that threatened to derail his presidency, right? So they, didn't, they couldn't do it. Why? Now, in the document, prosecutors said that they had, quote, effectively concluded their inquiry, which centered on payments made back during the campaign, allegedly to buy the silence of two women, that's Stormy Daniels and Karen McDougal, who they said had affairs with Trump before they said they didn't, or at least Stormy Daniels said she didn't. 
in her letter from 2018. So this guy was investigating, investigating. They ultimately come to the conclusion they can't do anything about this or something, right? We don't really know what it is. And we've heard from Michael Avenatti when he called into the Ari Melber show and he was explaining to him that they don't really know why, right? Even from his perspective, why this all came down because in 2018, Michael Avenatti wanted Trump prosecuted and he thought he had you know, campaign finance violations and all sorts of stuff, but the feds couldn't figure it out from the Southern District of New York. And this is the other prosecutor who at the same time before Alvin Bragg came in was in charge in Manhattan. So this guy preceded Alvin Bragg. He was actually elected, his name is Cyrus Vance, Cyrus from 2010 to 2022. I think that's a mistake about 2021 because he was succeeded by Alvin Bragg. So for, forgive me on that typo there. But we have some interesting, you know, situ an interesting situation here because Cyrus Vance, you know, we're, we're hearing like, oh, Stormy Daniels, hush money. This is um, illegal. And this is uh, something that is unbecoming of a president. And Donald Trump has you know, never acted so egregiously, no history of any president acting so monstrously. And so we have to go and prosecute him, which is the stupid line because this office has been I would say excusing and actually covering up evidence and faking evidence on behalf of actual criminals, right? We've got Jeffrey Epstein and Harvey Weinstein, who are the two people we're talking about here. They act like they're maybe, you know, sex crimes warriors, Trump mislabeled some, some payments or something, and this is egregious, trying to interfere with the election. They are corrupt as can be, okay? In Jeffrey Epstein's case, click this link over here, and what we're going to find is that this woman, her name is Jennifer Gaffney. She was a senior prosecutor for this office. This is Cyrus Vance, the head prosecutor, the guy who is formerly the Alvin Bragg position. Jennifer Gaffney, the woman you see here next to Epstein, she is or was formerly deputy of sex crimes working for Cyrus Vance. And we had two situations with her. One, when Jeffrey Epstein was being sentenced she argued for a deviation down, right? So she is a prosecutor. This is insane. Let's, in fact, click this article and see if we can follow through this one. But here is the background. Manhattan DA sided with Epstein, okay, after botching the investigation. So here's the background. The Manhattan DA's office, same one that we're talking about here, that once went to bat for a billionaire named Epstein after botching his, a review of his crimes, and, and swallowing his lawyer's claim that there were no victims here are, have now been released. Now, here's the background. This assistant DA, her name is Jennifer Gaffney. She was then deputy chief for Cyrus Vance. She asked a Manhattan judge to downgrade, right? She went to Manhattan, asked a judge to downgrade his sex offender registry status. The judge was stunned. Why is the Manhattan DA here? The Manhattan Supreme Court justice called Ruth Pickholtz said, I've never seen the prosecutor's office do anything like this. What? I've done so many cases much less troubling than this one where prosecutors would never make a downward argument like this. Now, Gaffney from Cyrus's office admitted that she never spoke to the Florida U.S. attorney who handled this. And, and she said, well, the judge, I don't think you did much of an investigation here. I'm shocked. Why are you in my office here? Why are you in my courtroom demanding that he get a lesser penalty? DA's office insists, right, Cyrus Vance says, I was not aware of this. Vance spokesman said, our prosecutor made a mistake. Gaffney, same prosecutor, also working on Harvey Weinstein. Weird. Left the DA's office in September. She declined to comment. Now, you know, it's very unusual. They say there's no way that Vance didn't know. All right, my point is, I'm sharing this with you, is don't... These people act like they are, you know, law and justice warriors or something. Like they have to get every spreadsheet row right. Every check needs to be appropriately designated, right? Give me a break, okay? They're partisan hacks. Their office went to bat for Jeffrey Epstein, as we just saw. And Jennifer Gaffney, the same woman, also under the direction of Cyrus Vance, was also involved in covering up evidence for a Weinstein victim, right? Here's a second member of the Harvey Weinstein prosecution team who quit the Manhattan DA's office last month over a controversy over the whether the lead investigator or the lead prosecutor covered up damaging evidence against an accuser, okay, against a victim. 
veteran prosecutor Jennifer Gaffney, deputy of the sex crimes, was thrown a going away party after her corrupt career. Her party took place just one day after the second chair also left. So it's, you know, it's as corrupt as we see like in Fulton County. It's a disaster DA's office. There's not justice going on. They're covering up for actual criminals like Weinstein, for Epstein, for these other people. And then they are, you know, turning around and saying now Trump is guilty of something that's that's essentially a spreadsheet crime. And they claim that they're purveyors of, you know, justice and fighting on behalf of Stormy and the people of New York. Give me a break. So we have some background there. This is this guy. Now, he also hired Mark Pomerantz, who we're going to learn about in a minute, to also come in and investigate Trump. And then in 2022, he didn't do anything with the case, right? He had many years. Remember, these are 2017 charges. So we now fast forward to about 2000. And 20, and now he doesn't do anything on this case either. Basically passes this whole thing off to somebody else, and that person is going to be Bragg. And that person, Bragg, we talked about. But remember, he also hired Mark Pomerantz. And so what I'm going to share with you is going to show how this case was rejected multiple times. We're just to catch up. Southern District of New York through Jeffrey Berman has already rejected this. Okay. Case already declined. Evidence is bad. Don't want it. Cyrus Vance sitting on this case. He doesn't want it. Doesn't do anything with it. He hires Mark Pomerantz. Mark Pomerantz is now involved with Alvin Bragg. This is Mark Pomerantz. You may remember him. We played some clips from him on our channel some time ago. He is the former Southern District of New York prosecutor, left back in the 80s, and then he went into private practice for a long period of time. He wrote this book after he left Alvin Bragg's office, but he was sworn in in February 2, 2021. So Mark Pomerantz comes in. He is now a special assistant prosecutor who is working for Alvin Bragg. Then he resigned right in, in anger, in fury. So he's there for about a year. He then resigned in February 2022 after Bragg comes sworn in. February 22nd, I believe, is the specific date on that. He leaves and is furious with Alvin Bragg, right? I'm, I'm, I can't believe you're not going to prosecute him, which is why he resigns. In fact, he wrote a resignation letter, and this is what he wrote in it on February 23rd. He says, you know, Alvin, I fear that your decision, Alvin, your decision, what decision? Does that mean that Alvin Bragg is not going to prosecute this case? Huh? So he just wins. He comes in. Mark doesn't. He, I can't believe this. I fear that your decision means that Mr. Trump will not be fully held accountable for his crimes. I have worked too hard as a lawyer and for too long now to become a passive participant in what I believe to be a grave failure of justice. Wow. I therefore resign from my position as the special assistant district attorney effective immediately, right? Mark Pomerantz is furious. He leaves, he grabs his ball, he goes home and he brings with him his partner who was also very against Trump from the beginning. He, this guy was Kerry Dunn. He was also a former Manhattan DA and he re resigned at the same time. And why would they resign is because Trump is not being prosecuted. In fact, both of these guys, Pomerantz and Dunn, they left private practice. Basically, we're like volunteering for the DA's office, right? These guys are making a lot of money in private practice. And they just decided, oh, we'll just leave and go prosecute Trump. So they go join the DA. He joined all the way back in 2017, was there for a while, fought and won got copies of Trump's taxes at the Supreme Court. So in other words, had been on this case going against Trump, like joins in 2017, right after Trump takes off. Oh no, I gotta do something. Goes back, joins, and then has been waging a war against Trump ever since. Resigned also with Mark Pomerantz in February. And then now with Pomerantz, these guys have co-founded, I guess it's called the Free and Fair Litigation Group. Okay, so they're gonna come out and now organize to stop Trump and MAGA. 
all the things. So that's Palmer, that's Kerry Dunn and Mark Pomerantz. Now this guy, you've heard a lot about. Donald Trump has met, ma ma Donald Trump has mentioned Matthew Colangelo many times, and you've heard his name brought up at rallies and speeches because he is a hatchet man for the left who has been following Trump around from the beginning. You see, this is what he looks like here. And he, very interestingly, has worked for everybody that you see on this screen. Okay, Obama, Tish, stinky Bigfoot, who takes her shoes off in court, waddles around in court. We got Biden and Alvin Bragg. So Colangelo, he also went to Harvard Law. Someone might wanna do a citation check on that. Obama deputy assistant, okay, before Trump came on the scene, he was over at the AG's office and was there for a while. Then he left Obama, right? So Obama leaves, Trump comes in, he joins Tish James. So he is there leading the charge in a number of different civil cases against Trump, going after Trump org and so on. And that opened up a lot of liability for guys like Weisselberg and so on. So then as soon as he's done with Tish and the Trump org stuff is he hands that off, Joe Biden comes back in and he becomes Joe Biden's acting associate AG at the DOJ. Guess what happens? Alvin Bragg decides he's not gonna prosecute Donald Trump anymore. Oh no, the Bragg prosecution is going awry. What happens? Oh, Matthew Colangelo goes over there next. So we follow the bouncing ball. He goes from Obama, he goes to Tish, he goes over to Biden, then he goes back over to Alvin Bragg, and every single time he's prosecuting Trump. Here is how it looks on a timeline every which way he joins the Obama DOJ acting associate under Merrick Garland. This happened back on January 20th of 2021. So he did serve some time with Biden. And that's why we make the allegation that Biden sent him to go over and prosecute Trump, literally bouncing offices. Before that, he was working for Tish. And then on 12-5, right, we're going to put this all in a timeline. On 12-5 of 2022, he joins Alvin Bragg's team. So every single one of these, he was prosecuting Trump, right? You can see how this works. It looks just like this with Trump in the middle. Colangelo waging war, a single individual focusing on Trump. Does this feel like fair and impartial justice to you? Does this feel like a prosecutor who is nonpartisan or does this feel like somebody with a vendetta who's made it literally their entire career, okay, to go after one person and to be enabled throughout the administrations, right? Now you might say, okay, it's not even necessarily Biden who is orchestrating the prosecution. This guy goes all the way back to Obama as we see here. So more Colangelo evidence. You see this guy has been around in a lot of things. He was filing this February 10th, 2020. This was a case against Trump. You see Matthew Colangelo, chief counsel, writing on behalf of Tish James. Same thing here. Attorney General Tish announces a lawsuit over a public charge rule, August 20th, 2019. So he is just, this case is being handled against Trump, Trump administration. Now, Trump's still in the office, right? He's still in the White House now. But guess who this is being led by? Chief Counsel for Federal Initiatives, Matthew Colangelo. So he's just kind of like a sleeper cell. You know, they just kind of move him around from location to location to location. And so to recap how this is working, let's just hit the timeline, right? This is how the timeline works. Starting off, and rem remember, before we even get here, okay, the charges started back in 2017. We're gonna to get to the charges in a second, but it was 2017, February, all the way through December. Payments, invoices, ledger entries were the basis of the charges. So they've had a long time. We're in 2024 now, long time has elapsed and they're just squeezing it in before the statute of limitations on the felonies expire. So here is where we pick this up. First, we recall that there was a declination to prosecute. Jeffrey Berman, back on July 18th, as we discussed, declined federal charges. There was no violation here. 
something happened. Alvin Bragg takes office. Dun, dun, dun. So it's already been declined once. Alvin Bragg takes office. He does a new and fresh review of the case. Do we think he is going to prosecute this case? Answer, no, he does not. He reviews the case, says Michael Cohen, Stormy Daniels, what? These people are whacked. We have no case here. This is going to be a disaster. So what happens? Mark Pomerantz and Kerry Dunn, they're out of here. They leave. They say this is ridiculous. Trump's not going to be prosecuted. He writes that whiny letter. <laughs> Justice. Okay, bye, Mark. Have a nice life. So then Alvin Bragg starts catching a lot of pressure. We covered this here. He says, oh, no, no, no. That's not what I meant. I am, in fact, going to prosecute this. And so he gets cold feet. Something else happens. Guess what? Now we've had two declinations. The feds have declined. Alvin Bragg has declined. And let's not forget, before Alvin took office, Cyrus Vance sat on this case and was twiddling his, his thumbs, trying to just drag it out to kick it down the road until he could pass it off to some other new prosecutor. So that's three different prosecutors who have now declined this case, ultimately. And they've had years to bring it. So what happens? All of a sudden, boom, guess what? Matthew Colangelo joins the team, the guy we just talked about. December 12, 2022, Pomerantz resigns in February. Fast forward to December, Matthew Colangelo joins the team. Guess where he came from? Oh, yeah, the Biden administration from the DOJ. He comes, he brings a cattle prod. He straps Alvin Bragg to a chair and, you know, threatens to withhold breakfast from him. And then, guess what? Boom. We get... A grand jury is now suddenly impaneled. Grand jury starts considering these charges. We get an indictment on March 30th, 2023. See how quickly everything changes? And the actual indictment from the grand jury, Colangelo joins December 12th. We get like a month later, grand juries impaneled. They start to dig into it and boom, March 30th, they get the charges. Incredible how quickly that works, right? Dragging, 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 dragging. Biden's guy, Colangelo, comes in. Boom. Grand jury gets impaneled. Charges come up. Trump gets gagged because this thing gets scheduled for trial. Now Trump can't say anything. And we've got trial just over a year away from the indictment while they're still just dropping off additional discovery, hundreds of thousands of pages, one by one. And so that's the timeline. And I think when you lay it out like this, you can see exactly how corrupt it is. They delayed, they delayed multiple declinations. Joe Biden's hatchet man, Matthew Colangelo joins the team and boom, within a, you know a couple of months, Bragg has been cattle prodded enough. He's like, all right, all right, I'll, I'll do it. Let's go. And then suddenly it all starts to come to fruition trial is scheduled. And of course, it's all based off a continual focused partisan prosecution led by people who've made it their career to prosecute him. All right. So what are the charges in the Trump trial in New York? Let's dig into the indictment. You can see this is a screenshot from the indictment itself. And it tells us that the grand jury of the county of New York by this indictment accuses Trump of this crime. It's called falsifying business records in the first degree. It's a spreadsheet crime. It's a check crime. And it is in violation of New York law, section 175.1. Now we're going to break down what this means and walk through it. But it's pretty simple. A business record is largely what it sounds like. And they're saying it was mislabeled, essentially, right? It was mischaracterized. And they did this for a whole slew of transactions. Let me show you what I mean. Here is a set of other excerpts from one batch of crimes. So you hear people on the left on MSNBC scream all the time, 34 felonies. Rah. Okay, let's sh break this down. Every felony is related to every single act. Each individual act is being teased out. We're getting very granular here. So Michael Cohen, as you can see from the indictment, wrote an invoice. Cohen sends an invoice, sends it over to Trump. Boom, that's a felony right there, one. And you, many people have received invoices, maybe even written invoices. So if you get an invoice, right, if you caused, according to Bragg, that invoice to be created, 
felony for you. Now, if that person, like your lawyer or whomever, sends you an invoice and you enter that invoice into a ledger, okay, put that into a spreadsheet, put that into your QuickBooks, write that into your checkbook, whatever, that's another felony. Boom. So if someone else sends you an invoice, you make a law. Oh, and, and then you say, well, I better log that. Don't want my bookkeeper to get mad at me. Put it in your records. And then felony number two, big trouble, man. How dare you? And then number three is you write a check and a check stub. So lawyer sends you an invoice. You put it into your log. You cut them a check to write the check back. Three felonies, easy as it can be. Now, this was only for February. So now you multiply that by a number of months, the invoice, the ledger, and the check. Felony, felony, felony. It's like Netflix on repeat, right? Every month, hey, three felonies, perfect. How, what, how, $5, oh, perfect. You know, send you the bill, You it enters, you pay it. Three felonies times three. Now there was one month or two where there were two entries, there was a double payment in one month, there were two bills, so they consolidated two months, but that's how this is broken down. Now we have some of the checks that have been released. I'm not sure if all of the checks have been released, but I grabbed one of them to give us an idea of what's happening. And we have some questions to ask ourselves. What are business records? Where did the money come from? Did it come from Trump's personal account, his business account? Did Trump sign this from a business you know, a bank account or a personal bank account? And what's it referencing? You know, Is this conducted in the ordinary course of business? So on and so forth. But you see, Trump was paying with checks, and they're going to introduce this into evidence. This check, as we'll also note, is from 10-18-2017, which, of course, is when Trump was in the presidency, right? He was the actual president at that time. So it's $35,000 to Michael Cohen, and this was part of the, the monthly retainer, right? Every month, he would send an invoice, get a ledger, get a check, and we'll talk about this, I'm sure, a lot more as the trial unfolds. But how does this all work? Here is another diagram that we created here to give us a breakdown of what's happening. So again, Michael Cohen, he sent 11 invoices and every single one of those was a felony. So invoices go over into the ledger, Trump organization or somebody's entering these in. They're saying these are business entries. This is a business entry, business record business record, there are 12 ledger entries, and then there are 11 checks that went back out. And every single check is a felony. Now, some of the checks were not signed by Trump. In fact, I think one was signed, it might've been by Don Jr. or Eric, I'm not clear on that, but one of the sons, and definitely one was also signed by Weisselberg. So Weisselberg may have signed a check and you might say, well, maybe he's not guilty of those, right? Maybe Trump is, the jury might say, well, he's only guilty of the ones he signed. So. Every single action is a business record that was falsified. Everyone's a felony. So the idea would be you just try to defend those, knock those off one at a time if you can't get them all done simultaneously. But Trump has already attempted and tried to say that they can't introduce evidence about official acts because he was the president. All of these entries came in from 2017, during 2017, when of course he was the president and the conduct were official acts. Was, these were things the president was doing and so there's an immunity argument there that has been submitted and rejected. Now, a portion of the money, a portion of those checks that went back to Michael Cohen, he would then create an LLC and then Stormy would be settled out from those LLCs. And the question is, you know, first of all, what was the nature of the, like these people are all liars. We got credibility about what's happening here and what Cohen did and where all this, you know, where all, what, what the mechanics of this were and who's going to say what but their credibility is quite bad. And there, there are questions about intent from this, from Trump to Cohen, right? What was the intent essentially of this check? And they're gonna say that they can infer Trump's intent or prove Trump's intent sufficient to a jury to say that he knew that these were erroneous entries that should have been chronicled differently and maybe not written off as a tax expenditure or something. We still don't know what his, what his theory of this case is, but. We're going to talk about that in a minute. So some other notes about these payments. Seven of these that we know of were for $35,000. Some uh, One other was for $70,000. Six were trying by, signed by Trump himself. One signed by the son. One signed by Weisselberg. And so when we talk about the actual charges now, as we meant re referenced, 
It's section 175.10, falsifying business records in the first degree. And this is a little bit, you know, confusing because first degree incorporates second degree. So let's go to second degree first and talk about that and then work our way up. Because as you can see here, they say a person is guilty of falsifying business records in the first degree when he commits the second degree. So we'll start there. It's second degree plus something. So what does the second degree say? Well, and they're going to have to prove this, right? So person is guilty in the second degree when they do one of the following, and it's an or, so it's one or two or three or four. So let's see if we can get rid of some of these options. First one sounds like it's probably it makes or causes a false entry in business records of an enterprise. So then that gives us a little bit of defense, right? From a defense perspective, we say, okay, well, what is a business record exactly? Was the ledger a business record? Is an invoice a business record? Is a Trump check from a personal account a business record? Because each one of those was charged as a felony. So we got to look at the definitions and see. And were these of an enterprise? Like is the Trump Cohen relationship and check relationship an enterprise or is that private counsel? Is that just a counsel relationship? So right, these are elements, they're, they're check boxes, got to check them off. So it's a false entry, something that's not true in the business records, another element of an enterprise. So Trump's defense will be attacking those and trying to undermine each one of those elements appropriately. So here, what about alters, erases, or destroys a true entry? I would say no, I don't think that's an issue in this case. No one destroyed anything. Omits to make a true entry. So like fails to write something in there that they should have. No, don't think that. How about prevents someone else from making an entry? No, I don't think that either. So Alvin Bragg is going to be relying on subsection one of second degree. And again, we're trying to break that. No, it's just, these are just transactions. Like, you know, I might hire a lawyer to do something, but I wouldn't call that a business record of an enterprise. That's just like me hiring some, some lawyer, right? So what are the definitions in New York? We're probably going to see a lot of that. And we'll see that, you know, pop up in the jury instructions. So Bragg needs to check, boom, false entry. Trump caused it to happen, right? He was the person who caused it to happen as another element and business records of an enterprise. So now, all of that, but we're not in second degree. We need something. So we need something to aggravate this from second degree into first degree. Let's go back to first degree. So now that we know what that is, if you do that, but you do that with intent to defraud, when his intent to defraud includes an intent to commit another crime or to aid or conceal in the commission thereof. Now, so again, we got our four elements plus something. It's going to be having intent to commit another crime. Again, and this is, this is you know, we've gotta be clear on this. It's intent to commit another crime. It's not that you did commit another crime. It's that you have intent to commit the crime. And it's not the intent of the crime, but it's your intent to do the thing which is nuanced and a little bit difficult to you know, disambiguate. But they say that this is what kicks it into a felony, right? So if you have all of second degree plus the intent to commit another crime or to conceal the commission, that's enough. So let's see how that works. This is what Judge Mercon had to say when he was asking about intent. They said, as is clear from the plain reading of the statute, it is not necessary that Trump be even convicted of the other crime. Okay, we don't need to prove the other crime. We don't need to say whether it was likely he was going to commit the other, nothing. It is his intent to commit those crimes that carries the day. So you're like, wait, what? So he had the intention to commit a crime in this case, and part of the intention or part of the elements of this case is that he also had the intent to commit another crime. Just right. So it's another element. He had intent to commit another crime. Okay. Does that other crime have to be provable? No. Does it have to be probable cause? No. Does it have to be and nothing? It's just he intended to do it. Okay. And it's going to be a big fat, broad standard as we're going to see. So the judge has already given us a framework on this. So when the trial starts, 
This is what we're going to be looking for. We saw that the statute tells us it is about an intent to commit another crime or to aid or conceal the commission thereof. So this is a little bit heavy lifting here. But what other crime, okay, what other possible object crime could be the subject of the statute to make it in the first degree? You've got to have intent of another crime. So we have a couple of options. One, intent to violate the federal election law, right? Michael Cohen, he already pled guilty to making unlawful campaign contributions, which we'll talk about in part two of this journey where we're debriefing what's happening here in this trial. So remember that the Southern District of New York has already declined this, as we've talked about. Jeffrey Berman said, nope, don't need to prosecute this. There's nothing here. Cyrus Vance, all the other people have not done anything with this case up until now, but they're saying that he doesn't, there doesn't need to be evidence that he actually violated this, just intent to violate it. So I don't know, you know how they're going to prove that, but they're going to say Michael Cohen, the judge wrote Michael Cohen has already pleaded guilty on this thing. So that could be one angle. Now there's going to be defenses on this that I think the judge has already dismantled, but one defense would be that Cohen or that these crimes didn't happen geographically in New York, right? It's a federal crime that's not in their jurisdiction. And the judge has basically said that that doesn't matter. They can still rely on that. So in furtherance of the intent, the hypothetical intent to commit a federal election crime is one idea. The other is the intent to violate New York election law. So they'll say, well, you were going, intending to commit federal law. And by intending to commit federal law, that means you intended to violate New York law, right? So it's like a waterfall. By intending to violate federal law, you also intend to violate New York law, which I think this is to save them, to give them some jurisdiction back. So we're following the bouncing ball. Like this is not normal in a criminal case, obviously. We have to like stretch yourself to make this happen. But conspiracy, they say you might also intend to violate New York election law, which, which makes it illegal to engage in a conspiracy to promote the election of a person through unlawful means. You can't get someone elected illegally. And if you're trying to do that by violating federal law, that's illegal. But they're not saying that Trump did violate it, just that he intended to, which is wild, right? So you have to really infer a lot there. And also intent to violate New York tax law saying that they gave Michael Cohen more money, right? 35 times 12, whatever that is, it's like $400,000, $480,000. And so Cohen got paid, he was grossed up. They included the tax compensation in there. And under New York statutes, they say, you're not allowed to do that either. So these payments were conducted in order to give Cohen more money that was not earned. You're not allowed to do that in New York. And so that makes it a crime, right? And so those are the three ways that the judge, Mershon, basically gave them paint by numbers. Just make sure you say put that in there, right? And if they can show that, then it's just going to spiral up and they'll say that gives them jurisdiction to, to satisfy the another crime, intent to commit another crime element that will satisfy the four, I'm sorry, the five main elements. So Trump caused it. There was a false entry. There were business records that was an enterprise and we have another crime that was intended to have been committed and either one of any one of those three will matter. So when you see people saying this kind of feels like a stretch, like it's not very clear, right? You, you know, you get a DUI. It's like, were you driving a car and was your alcohol limit above the legal limit? Yes or no. Bah, bah. Here are the elements we prove. It's not like, did you intend to get in the car and then also intend for this to happen some other day? And maybe you did, maybe you didn't. It's very speculative because intent is hard to prove in the first place. And that's what the judge has articulated is allowable. So speaking of the judge, who is the judge? Juan Mercon, actually pronounced Mershon. We say Mercon because it kind of rhymes with Juan. Juan Mercon, it kind of has a cadence to it, but okay. It's Mershon. His, his daughter's name is Lauren. We'll learn about her too. He is an immigrant, came into the United States from Columbia at six years old, 1994, became the assistant DA in Manhattan, so where Alvin Bragg is working now. He then, in 1999, became a New York State AG, worked for their office, 
was appointed by Michael Bloomberg to family court back in 2006. In 2009, he became appointed as the acting justice, which is his position right now. And again, just like the prosecutors, this guy has been highly involved in Trump cases. Weird. He always gets assigned to them. Strange. He presided over the Trump tax organization trial that we covered some here. He presided over the Alan Weisselberg trial, the CFO, who was then uh, convicted and has now been resentenced to prison as a perjurer because they're trying to shatter his credibility as the trial comes afoot because Michael Cohen is a terrible witness for them. So they think if they have one perjurer on their side, they'll just create an engineer, a perjurer on the other side, which is what we have, of course. And then in 2022, he is also right now presiding over a trial that is scheduled to go in May of this year. So trial start, the case started in 2022, the Steve Bannon fundraising trial is scheduled to also start in May, pr pr uh, provided that this trial is completed. So Judge Juan Mercan, we've learned about him. We know that he likes Democrats. He donated to Joe Biden and did that via Act Blue. And it was a total of $35. You can see Juan Mercan signing off on the internets, donating through Act Blue on two separate days. This one looks like 726, 2020. He's getting agitated. He's at 15 bucks on that day. 727, 2020, another 10 bucks. And then 727, another 10 bucks. So 15, 10, and 10. And he's just like, and he's just donating very furious, you know, furiously over three days. And now we see he doesn't think that's a big problem at all, given the fact that his daughter literally works for Joe Biden, as we're about to see, and he's donating to Joe Biden, and he has an opportunity now to convict Joe Biden's political opponent. Isn't that nice? Isn't that interesting? So that is his donations. We also have more from him because he gave an interview to the media that is seemingly biased, not appropriate for a judge to do that. He says, you know, there's no agenda here. He went and sat down with the AP. There's no agenda here. Mercan wouldn't talk about the case last week, but he allowed that getting ready for the historic trial is intense. Really? How come? He says he's striving to make sure that I've done everything I could to be prepared and to make sure that we dispense justice, he said in an interview, emphasizing his confidence in his court staffers. He says there's no agenda here. Huh. Only people who have an agenda have to say that, right? We want to follow the law. We want justice to be done. That's all we want. Okay. So normal judges don't have to say that. We want justice to be done. Sounds like you're vouching for yourself. Oh, no, we don't have an agenda. We want justice to be done. Well, what does that mean? Should we just presume that? So why do you have to clarify? So in other words, do you, it sounds like you might be defensive, like you, you're defending yourself because people are saying that you have an agenda. So you're defending yourself by saying there's no agenda. Some people are saying you're a partisan hack who's just trying to go get Trump. You're saying we just want justice to be done. Okay, so you're defending yourself. So you are speaking about this case. Huh, weird. And you're speaking about the case to defend yourself against the criticisms from the Trump team. So you're biased, obviously. Next, we have the judge and his daughter, Lauren Mercan. We're familiar with her. She is a political activist who raises tens of millions of dollars for Democrats, and she's talked to her dad a lot about this case and about Donald Trump. Maybe not about this case, I can't say that, but definitely about Donald Trump because she was bringing it up on a podcast. And you see this photo came from these two, and I support a father and a daughter having a great relationship, obviously. Clearly, you want them to have a good relationship, and it would be insane if what his daughter was doing did not impact him, wouldn't it? Like, it, it's like, it's your daughter. So if your daughter's entire career is being a Democrat operative, she is a co-owner of a company that this is their entire profession, and her work is with your work, isn't that conflicted? Don't you want your daughter to do well? And wouldn't it be a problem if you did something adversarial to your daughter by dismissing a hack prosecution case? Yeah, because she's fundraising off of it, as we're going to see.
but they have a nice relationship and that's why he needs to be recused because he does love his daughter as we would expect him to do. But as we know, Lauren explained to us that her dad does not like Donald Trump, especially when he is tweeting on the interwebs. He is very uh, agitated when Trump starts mouthing off on the interwebs. And here is what that podcast sounded like. I'm curious to get your take on why digital in particular is a useful medium for candidates to convey authenticity. So I've actually had a, a couple conversations with my dad recently where he's kind of like, I hate that politicians use Twitter and like, it's so unprofessional and, you know, that's not how a politician should behave themselves. And I explained that like, yeah, I think there are a lot of instances where it is not used in like when our president tweets anything that he thinks and like, that's not what he should be using it for. But the pro is that candidates aren't sort of at the mercy of the traditional media anymore. And candidates like to go back to AOC can, even if they aren't getting the attention that they need or want, can get out there in another way. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I think AOC is amazing. AOC is amazing. Trump's the monster. Dad hates Trump, but AOC is incredible. We love her. Yay. All right. So. Here is some background on her Twitter. Now, I grabbed this from Laura Loomer, and this was posted on X, but this was a screenshot and a screen grab from what looks to be Lauren Mercon talking at Campaign Tech, some sort of you know digital campaign event. The evolution of future marketing and automation to chatbots and their future for campaigns, right? I remember when everybody was very excited about chatbots Install a chat button. You don't have to talk to your clients anymore. And everyone's like, yeah, great. Our clients are terrible. And I was like, hey. All right. So Lauren Mercon, right there. Authentic campaigns on the title. And at Lauren M426 is the title. It's a nice grab. Campaign tech. That's the title, right? And so shout out to Laura Loomer. That's where I saw this one. So that is, looks like it's her. Now, if you go over to that one, that same account, Lauren M426, uh-oh, she posted this one, says, bye. Like one of those annoying chicks, you know? Yeah, oh gosh. She posted that on January 20th. It says, Trump departs the White House for the last time as president. Bye. Lauren Mercon, judge's daughter. Now, it's maybe just, you know, a, an, an aberrant post, not a big deal. She also posted this one on Lauren M426. Trump should be in prison. Huh. You know who has the capability to do that, don't you? Her dad. Literally. Her dad. Yeah. So Lauren wants Trump in prison. Now, she ultimately changed that post and then deleted the account or something. But yeah, a little bit curious, isn't it? Now here's what she does. Lauren Mercon, the judge's daughter. So this was from some of the work she does from her featured clients. You see some of the worst people in America, Biden, Harris, United Nations, NRDC, Shifty Schiff for president, Michelle for mayor, Kamala is literally on the list, right? Kamala Harris, Biden Harris. She's working for Joe. Her daddy is prosecuting Trump, daddy's opponent. All of these other people, Cory Booker, Governor Newsom, Whitmer, Hochul, all part of her enterprise. Now, this is also something she posted. She says, we wrote for Joe Biden, we reached 200,000 new undecideds with AI and digital media, and we engaged a bunch of people over there. And also said... For Adam Schiff, Authentic is the name of her company. Authentic HQ, writing for Pencil Neck Shift. We helped Adam Shifty raise a record-breaking $8 million in quarter two. That's from her, her company, Authentic HQ. We did a great job. And how do they make that money, you might wonder? Where does this raising money, where does this come from? How do they help Adam Schiff get $8 million? Well, they market the Trump prosecution. Isn't that interesting? You see, this is what Schiff did. This is a Facebook ad that her company runs. 
Authentic HQ creates these campaigns and it tells you to donate. That's how they make their money. And what is Shifty so excited about? Breaking news! Trump has been indicted. Can you donate now to help us defeat him and his MAGA movement? Defend our democracy from Act Blue. So the daughter is writing campaign advertisements for Schiff, focusing on Trump's prosecution, the same prosecution that her daddy is overseeing. And she's making millions of dollars on that. How do we know? Because these are the numbers. Schiff for Congress paid them 10 million. Senate PAC paid them a million. 115,000 for Lauren Underwood. Barbara Lee, software. Jeffries for Congress, $35, whatever that is. Shifty, another 4 million. Senate majority, 1.6 million. Is that the same one? Here's a new one. $29 million for different years. Yeah, these are different years. It's the same entities, but different. So that was 14 million. That was 18 million, 14 million, and 29 million. That's her entity, authentic, getting paid for this crap. $93 million in total. And so you add all of that up and that's a pretty big problem. And if daddy decides to dismiss the case because it is illegitimate, daughter cannot write these campaign ads anymore. Daughter is suddenly screwed because the case has been dismissed and Shifty's campaign is now done. So lots of money being grifted on the back of this prosecution. And when Donald Trump decides to talk about it, guess what? Judge gags his butt, says, okay, on April 1st, you can't talk about us. You can't talk about my family. Don't you talk about my daughter. Judge gagged Trump the first go round. And then when everybody started to point all that out, that they were making 93 million, then they decided to also gag Trump from talking about family members as well. And when the public wants to dive into this, we don't get access either. You see the judge said, sorry, public access is denied. This case law is inapplicable and we have an absolute ban on trial. And so none of this is relevant and all papers are gonna continue to be published only as I see fit. And so nothing is accessible from Mercon. And so this is just part one of our discussion on who the people are involved in this prosecution. We're gonna continue on with witnesses in part two, which will be covering Stormy Daniels, Michael Cohen, Karen McDougal, David Pecker, and all of the other people who we expect to see in the trial. And we're expected to also meet the Trump defense team. And so we'll be here covering that, my friends. Thank you for subscribing and joining us Stay in tune for part two. That's coming up next. All right, my friends. So hopefully that was useful. Hopefully we got our bearing straight on that one. And we will come back and fill in the rest of the gaps on that. But that uh, there was a lot there. We got Michael Cohen. We got Stormy Daniels and others coming up. So thanks for subscribing. We also got some great links down in the description below. We're gonna continue on, we're not done here yet. We got good logic coming up next that we're talking about, but hopefully that was useful and we're now getting more and more up to speed on what's happening. All right, so we're not done yet. Let's move on. We got segment number two happening now. There's one journalist in New York who's fighting for free speech for America, and you know him. His name is Good Logic. He's on YouTube, he's on Rumble, and he's on Locals. And we're going to read through a filing that he was brave enough to submit with courage to go into the lion's den. Of course, New York, where Donald Trump is on trial in the Bragg prosecution, where the key witnesses are Stormy Daniels and Michael Cohen. And Trump has been gagged, right? He's running for president. 2024 leading contender. We all like to hear from him to see what he has to say about the justice system, given the fact that the justice system is kind of an important issue in America, but he's not allowed to talk about it because we have a problematic relationship with the judge and the daughter that is really bad for the judge to hear us all talk about. And so Trump is gagged. Nothing can come out unless Joe Nearman, good logic, 
has something to say about it. And so our friend Joe, his channels are linked in the description below on YouTube. Be sure you're subscribing to him. This is what is now being filed in the Trump prosecution outside of the Trump prosecution in an appeal challenging Mercon's gag of Trump. Good logic. Joe Neerman writes the following. All right, courts in New York, appellate court. Here's my verified petition. Of course, the case is good logic and Joe Neerman versus Juan Mercon, the gagger. He says, okay, Joe Neerman, good logic is here. I'm writing this. And the reason we're doing this is because I want this court to do the following. First and foremost, overturn Judge Mercon's gag order that was entered against Donald Trump referenced in the indictment. And number two, overturn the clarification, an additional order that gagged Trump even harder. And number three, obtain a temporary restraining order that stays this gag and allows Trump to speak and also enjoin any other orders as this case proceeds and any other relief that you have deemed appropriate. Now, Joe says, I am a party to this lawsuit and this is important. He says, I'm not just a regular citizen. First of all, I'm a resident of New Jersey, but I'm an attorney and I'm licensed to practice law there in New York. I do business there. I've got my law license from you where this case is. And additionally to that, I am also a reporter, says Joe. Licensed to operate in the city of New York. And Joe has press credentials that were issued by the city of New York to say, hello, I'm a reporter. I need to report on the news. So good logic. He's formed in New Jersey. He's the exclusive owner. And the purpose of this is to create brilliant political and legal analysis, which he does well. He says, upon information and belief, Mercon is a judge. We know the story with him. So here's the background. Our friend, Good Logic, who's on YouTube, Rumble, and next door on Local, says, across a multitude of social media platform, petitioners, Good Logic, provide legal information, philosophical discussion, and entertaining, that's for sure, commentary regarding law, politics, and current events. He says, Good Logic controls YouTube, two channels on YouTube. One's called Good Logic, and the other one is called The Trump Trial. You should subscribe to both of those. Now, additionally, he also controls channels on Rumble and other sites, has over 100,000 subscribers select, uh, collectively, and he also promotes on X, where he's got 40,000 followers. And the point of this, right, is to tell us there's a lot of people who want to hear this, a lot of people interested in this stuff and in these stories, and it's a critical issue in our election, right? We, we, the First Amendment is not only about the right to speak. We can all just blab our mouths. But if nobody can listen to you because you can criminalize the listening or prevent the listening by criminalizing the speaker, right? That is impinging upon our right to hear. Joe says, petitioners live stream to good logic channels five or six nights a week because he's a workhorse man. And he averages over two hours per episodes. The live streams focus on legal and political news, usually get over 10,000 views, as many as 50. Now, Joe's audience comes from both sides of the political aisle because he's a free thinking man. Petitioners work to enlighten their audience about strengths and weaknesses of opposing claims and philosophies and legal arguments and to consider alternative viewpoints. And the popularity of Joe's channels arise from a focus of avo avoiding being a homer for a political viewpoint and encouraging the audience to, you know, think for yourselves without hesitating to question viewpoints promoted by anybody even petitioners themselves. He says, question Joe. He's all for it. Let's talk. Now, the civil and criminal actions against President Trump are a frequent topic on Joe's channels. People both from both sides of the aisle crave information about this case. And he says, by the way, Trump is not merely the 45th president of the United States. He's also the presumptive nominee for 2024. And it's indisputable that his Trump's thoughts, ideas, and words carry great significance to millions of Americans, whether they love him 
loathe him, or whether they fall somewhere in between. Now, the U.S. Supreme Court has made clear that Joe's audience, like all Americans, have the right to hear from Trump's own mouth his thoughts about political corruption and the potential weaponization of our courts and our prosecutors, saying, in a quote, this right to listen to Trump has its fullest and most urgent application at a campaign for political office. Now, Mercan's gag order unconstitutionally infringes upon Trump's freedom of speech. That's true. But it's beyond that, okay? It carries over to an infringement on Joe's right to freedom of the press. And Joe, as a member of the press who's duly licensed in New York, he has a fundamental First Amendment right too to receive and to report about this, about his involvement in the justice system. And Mercan is illegally restraining Trump from speaking about the case. And what does that do? Oh yeah, it causes irreparable harm, not only to good logic, but guess what, America? To the audience of the amazing Good Logic channels and to its viewers and to us, the American people. So Joe continues to write brilliantly. He says, let's, let's talk about this. He says, first of all, members of the media have the right to challenge gag orders, right? New York Times, we could do this. They wrote in New York Times, others brought an original action to the appellate court pursuant to Article 78, just like Joe's doing here, to prohibit enforcement of an oral ruling in a criminal action that directed all the attorneys to stop talking to the media. The court said, the restrictive order in question is constitutionally impermissible, so the gag is not allowed. Imposition of a gag order is constitutionally impermissible. Great citation. He says, similarly, in NBC, this case from 1986, the court there explained that NBC clearly has standing to question the directive that challenges the ability to speak with the media. You can't gag there either. And so based on the foregoing, we have the right to challenge. We have the standing to be here. We, have a, we can bring this claim. Other people have done it, and we're here doing it too. Now, here's the problem. Here's the proceeding that was bad. Joe says, on or about March 30th, Bragg got an indictment against Trump. Case went over to Mercon, was assigned over there for some reason. Now, Trump was arraigned on April 4th, and news reports indicated that there was a discussion of the gag order at the arraignment itself. During that hearing, at the very beginning of the case, Mercon came out and he said, you know, gag orders like restraints are the most serious and the least intolerable on First Amendment rights. And that applies doubly to Mr. Trump because he's a candidate for presidency. It's like, oh yeah, that's a good point. Thanks for reminding the judge. Upon information and belief, Joe says, the court issued no order restraining Trump's speech at his arraignment, but then he made a request on the issue. CNN said, please refrain from making comments that are engaging in or, or doing conduct that's likely to incite violence, create civil unrest, or jeopardize America. Okay, we're familiar with all that. Joe says, now this indictment was the first time in American history that a former president was indicted by grand jury. Bragg was first. It was the first of the four indictments that Trump would have to face. In addition, Trump was also indicted in Florida and D.C. and Big Fanny Land. Additionally, he spent last year defending multiple claims, E. Jean Carroll and Tishy. And finally, he had to fight off getting removed from the ballot. SCOTUS blew them out of the water. Remember Judge Luddig? Undeniable, irrefutable, unequivocal. Sorry, Judge, 9-0. Upon information and belief, Trump reacted similarly to each challenge. Trump said, I'm being prosecuted, persecuted. I'm a victim of a witch hunt, routinely mocked, questioned the competence of other people, judges, prosecutors, witnesses. And so these are generally referred to as Trump's statements. Now, despite the similarity of his statements, Trump has a right to free speech and the public has a right to freedom of the press. Now, in most scenarios, the court and even prosecutors recognize the sanguinity of Judge Mercan's initial take, right? He said, you're running for president. Now, while the indictment was issued in March 2023, Bragg waited nearly a full year until Feb 26 to then try to gag Trump. 
at the time the subject motion was filed, Bragg's trial was sent to commence on the 25th. So he filed it like a month before, less than one month. With international media attention now ramping up, Trump's now the major candidate. The timing of the motion was as damaging as possible to Trump and to allow little opportunity for appellate oversight. Great point. The whole case has really been like this where they're just delaying. Pre-indictment delay, right? Delay, delay, delay. Then go at the last minute. Trial happens. You have no time to appeal. They dump all the discovery within the last month or 100,000 pages of it. And Trump can't get it together in time by design. Now, significantly, no claim was ever made by the movements that a single one of Trump's statements ever broke federal law. No charges have ever been brought. Now, there was an order from Trump, which we've read here many times. He can't talk about the family members of people who are related to the case. But it did not purport to govern Trump's statements about Mercon. Now, shortly after the order was issued, Trump came out on True Social. Trump wrote this on Truth. He said, back on March 28th, he said, Judge Juan Mercon is totally compromised and should be removed from this Trump case immediately. His daughter, Lauren, is a rabid Trump hater who has admitted to having conversations with her father about me that we played in our first segment, and yet he gagged me. Now, she works for crooked Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, Adam Shifty Shift, and other radical leftists who campaign on getting Trump, and they fundraise off the Biden indictments, including this witch hunt, which her father presides over, a total conflict and attacking Biden's political opponents through the courts. Former DA Cy Vance refused to bring this case, as did all federal agencies, including elections. Joe says, now the subject social media post caused them to expand the order. Then they came back in and they expanded to the family members of the court and the DA. Originally, it wasn't all of them, but now they expanded it. And Trump got a warning saying, if you violate this order, you're in big trouble. So the background is now complete. And now Joe's going to take us through some arguments. And he's got several. He writes, all right, there are several fatal flaws with your gags, Trump judge. Now, any of these flaws warrant a grant of this petition. Here are the three that we're going to dig into. One, there was a flawed analysis of case law by Mercon, and also a flawed application of case law that and defendants' fundamental rights to a fair trial flawed analysis of case law, a flawed application of the case law, and an interference with Trump's fundamental right to a fair trial. He says, all right, let's be clear about what happened with Judge Juan. He says, the court's analysis from Mercon stands in a 180 degree opposition to the very cases that the court used to justify its decision. In other words, the judge relied on cases that say the opposite. He says they say something, but it's literally the opposite. He wrote, the freedom of speech is guaranteed by the First Amendment and the state's interest in the fair administration of justice. See that? State's interest. Does the state have an interest? Hmm. Now, the court cited Landmark and Shepard, two important cases. And he said, well, Mercon, we have this balancing test and we'll be able to use this to decide. Now, logic, good logic says, uh, no, not so fast, uh, Judge Mercon. Silly. He says, I respectfully submit that it was material error for Judge Mercon to conclude that either one of these cases directed or even permitted the court to engage in any sort of balancing test at all. I don't know what, Joe's like, I don't know what case he read, but they don't say that. One that there was a purported state interest of prosecuting against the accused and the individual's First Amendment rights. He says, what are you talking about, Mercon? No such balancing test is ever permitted under the law. It's not what we do here. And your flawed reasoning seems rooted in an unjustifiable expansion of the phrase. What does this even mean? Fair administration of justice that has no basis in the Constitution or legal precedent at all. They just invented it. Just like protecting our democracy, you know? Okay. SCOTUS cases that were cited by the judge, as well as all of the precedents 
that engage in a balancing test, they all deal with one group or individual's First Amendment rights versus another individual's constitutional rights to a fair trial, not the government versus the people. Whenever the fair administration of justice is pitted against First Amendment rights, Joe says fairness is always moored to an objective of protecting the rights of the accused. So the administration of justice is to protect the Trump team, not the court, not the judge, not the prosecutor. They already have the government, okay? They keep acting like Trump is this big bag boogeyman who's more powerful than the whole DOJ or New York City, I guess. If he says something, we're all gonna die. It's like, are you kidding? Trump posts a truth and there's gonna be like the purge happening on the streets. Not only does the government have unlimited money, they have unlimited power, they have unlimited resources in terms of people and buildings and all things. They have everything in their favor, plus the power of the microphone, the power to prosecute, the power to imprison, the power, they have it all. Now they're saying, you can't talk bad about us too. What? That's the only thing we have is our speech. That's why it's the First Amendment. So they just expand this fair administration of justice. What are you talking about? In this context, it's designed to protect an individual's right to due process. And every time the court is engaged in this analysis, it was in recognition of a clash between the amendments, the first, the sixth, the 14th, and the first. Fair administration of justice is never used as a basis to protect the state. There's no constitutional amendment designed to protect the state from the accused, unless it's Trump, because he's, you know, so dangerous. Now in Landmark, Joe says, the state had passed a law that made it a crime to divulge information about a, a judicial review commission. The basis for the law was that if you disclose, then it might be dangerous to the people who were being investigated, who were the accused, right? If you, t like, okay, we're investigating judges. Well, we can't tell you who we're investigating. Why? Well, because they've only been accused. They haven't been convicted of anything and we want to protect their rights. The state said, well, we have interest in the fair administration of justice. We want to protect the accused, not the government. But guess what? The landmark court concluded that first amendment rights triumphed, okay? So even if you're trying to protect the accused, you still lose because we have a right to see that stuff. Now, similarly, Shepard was expressly decided based on the recognition of the accused rights to due process. Reviewing the activities of a criminal trial where a voracious media married their virulent speculation about the guilt of the accused. This guy's guilty or all over the place, kind of like what's happening here. The continual chaotic conduct in out of courtroom activities affecting the defendant. The court took no steps to control the chaos. The court found that the rights of the accused had been unfairly impacted by the free exercise of the First Amendment rights. Now, the court left no room for the confusion. They said fair administration of justice may trump unfettered rights of free press only when rooted in constitutional rights of the accused. They expressly said this. We've concluded that Shepard did not receive a fair trial consistent with the due process clause of the 14th amendment and we reverse the judgment because the media was so bad. But the most pivotal failure of Mercon's analysis was to recognize this, the clash of the constitutional rights to free speech that necessitated the balancing test in Landmark. What was the danger of what was said against the need for free expression? But the state trying to prosecute an individual, the state doesn't have constitutional rights. And so under landmark, a prosecutor seeking to imprison someone is never entitled to the opportunity of persuading the court to enter a balancing test. Landmark stands for principles that are the opposite. The very objective of our freedom of speech and of the press is to call out corruption and to keep the, the courts in check. The First Amendment is purposefully designed to enable political speech, as they said in Landmark. Whatever differences may exist about the interpretations of the first, there is practically universal agreement that a major purpose of the first was to protect the discussion 
the free discussion of governmental affairs. That's the point. So they said there was a First Amendment right to attack both the court and those who work for the court. They say the law gives judges as pe persons or courts as institutions no greater immunity from criticism. The operations of the court and the judicial conduct of the judges are a matter of utmost public concern. So we're not limiting you, gagging you from speaking about our investigations. Now, by distinguishing the operations of the court as separate from judicial conduct of the court, SCOTUS, the Supreme Court, made evident that it was not merely the judge himself who may and should be scrutinized, but also the clerks and the court. And so landmark, Joe says, the decision that Judge Mercon literally relied on, it directly invalidates his order. Judge Mercon said th this order is justified by landmark. Joe says it literally says the opposite. Okay, you're saying something different than what the case says. So landmark then directly invalidates sections B1 of your order, which apparently purports to insulate counsel and members of the court staff from criticism levied by Trump. He's literally allowed to criticize you. And moreover, whether one agrees with Trump or not, or his criticisms, it's inarguable that the overwhelming majority of his posts carry an overt political message, meaning their political speech protected accordingly. Now that is precisely the terrain of free speech and of the press that Landmark sought to insulate. This court, Mercon, cherry-picked a handful of statements to reach its conclusion while thoroughly ignoring all sentences immediately preceding or following a favored passage. Now, however, however, reliance on Landmark as a legal foundation for silencing the accused because of legal corruption that he's complaining about requires spinning that decision on its head until it's upside down, until up is down, down is Northwest, and we're living in Crazyville. It's thoroughly flawed, and it should be overturned by this court. Amazing work from Joe Neerman. Good logic. His channel is linked down in the description below. He continues with a second argument. Joe writes, unlike those cases, this case also involves prior restraint of free speech. Those were after. Now the Supreme Court is loath to ever validate a prior restraint on the speech. Any prior restraint on expression comes with a heavy presumption against its constitutional validity. Now, if there is a heavy presumption against a valid gag order, how much more so would it be when an individual is being restrained, he happens to be the leading candidate for the presidency? Hmm. And we're in the middle of a campaign scheduled in seven months. Now, it's unfathomable, says Joe, that the litany of Supreme Court decisions that repeat their disdain for gag orders would ever grant license to restrain Trump's speech unless Trump's statements were established to be the cause of a grave harm that could not be averted by any less serious measures. And so thus, if we allow Mercon to use this so-called balancing test, it's going to cause harm by issuing a restraint on free speech that's a prior restraint in opposition to what the courts say is appropriate. Now, Mercon actually quoted Landmark. He wrote this in his order. He said, properly applied, the test requires the court to make its own inquiry into the eminence and magnitude of the court of the danger said to flow from the utterance and then to balance the character of evil against the likelihood and the need for free and unfettered speech. And they're saying the nature of Mercon's inquiry was to review documents filed by Bragg. However, that review is not sufficient to warrant the infringement upon Trump's rights. Bragg's motion also set forth a correlative length between the danger and the utterance and didn't establish a causative link. So Trump's speeches, you know, statements, there's no showing that he actually caused any harm. Specifically, the mo motion alleges an increase in frequency of threatening, okay, or racist, all right, or other unjustifiable communications. Now, in no way does an increase in frequency say that Trump did it. Rather, it seems equally, if not more likely, that the indictment itself, the extensive media coverage of the indictment, maybe all the whack jobs on MSNBC, caused a reaction from what Joe says are the craziest of crazies. Now, Good logic is in no way excusing any of these statements. A lot of it is reprehensible and abhorrent. 
those actions are indefensible and any statements like that do merit public scorn. But as gross as these communications might be, their increased frequency was predictable. Okay, the case is getting closer to trial, Alvin. Like trial scheduled a month from now. Clearly it's going to get more heated as this gets closer to trial. We could also similarly predict that in a hypothetical scenario where Andrew Bailey indicts Barack Obama, that Bailey would be on the receiving end of innumerable bad no-no messages. But there's too many unhinged people at the ends of both sides of the aisle to make that a justification for banning speech. So the question that was begged by the court was whether the improper communications resulted from Trump. It's well-established law that First Amendment restraint must draw strict scrutiny, the highest standard, and you did not conduct an evidentiary hearing, judge. Strict scrutiny means we have to really have a good reason before we, we impose on your fundamental rights with government action. And this judge didn't even hold a hearing, didn't even make factual determinations here, didn't talk about the manner of the restraint, any benefits in the issuing of the restraint. And still today, both the judge and Trump and the rest of the world have no idea if there were certain topics or specific words that seem to cause an increase in these so-called improper communications. No idea. But rather than conduct a hearing to enable the court to get into this and justify a remedy with a compelling need, the judge just accepted Bragg's claims, and that's it. So an evidentiary hearing would have enabled the judge to adduce which words were problematic and make a determination about how public reaction could have been impacted. But they didn't do that. In lieu of conducting a hearing and properly tailoring, using some good constitutional language here, the prior restraint on Trump's speech, no, he didn't do that. He just issued an order as broad as possible, calling it, Joe calls it a fig leaf, saying the orders cannot be constitutional because they lack an evidentiary hearing. So we can't see whether this was narrowly tailored to, 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 to meet a compelling government interest. Even if Trump's statements were found to have directly caused an increase, there's no evidence that a restraint on future Trump statements could also have an impact. There are countless uncertainties about the need for this gag and the harms that come from silencing Trump. And so the only certainty now is that Trump's First Amendment rights have been infringed. It is submitted that there is a heavy presumption against constitutional validity, and that is crushing to a court order that gags Trump without even having a hearing about whether there's a causative link between Trump's speech and the danger flowing from the said speech. Nothing was shown that it was a compelling need. There was no narrowly tailored order. And so this all must wilt under strict scrutiny analysis, saying accordingly, even if Mercon's reading of Landmark were not misguided as it is, the improper application of a balancing test is lethal to the outcome. Failure to conduct an evidentiary hearing means we cannot say that even the constitutional analysis was conducted appropriately. And lastly, Joe Nearman, Good Logic's final argument, his channel is linked down in our description, he says, let's talk about Trump's fundamental rights to a fair trial and how those are being dumped on. First, by quelling Trump's right to speak about anything related to witnesses, they've made it impossible for Trump to have a fair trial and his due process rights are being violated. And while Trump is the individual facing criminal charges and none of the witnesses face criminal charges, Mercon has enabled the government witnesses to viciously malign Trump on the eve of trial and they've stripped away from him any opportunity to respond. This has an obscene impact of allowing witnesses to poison a jury before they walk into a courtroom. And the opportunity for witnesses to malign Trump is not theoretical. It happens all the time. We've talked about it. Stormy Daniels released a 109-minute-long documentary called Stormy. Published that on Peacock. She sure did, didn't she? On March 18th, and she timed that to be released right before the trial started on March 25th, just a week later. Very convenient. A review of the film's trailer, looks like Joe didn't watch it either, 
says it makes it irrefutable that Stormy centers around her relationship with Donald Trump and his alleged payments to Daniels that are central to the whole story. It's Stormy's whole claim to fame. She's making money off this thing. And when Trump said, can I please see other ev evidence that went into the creation of that film? Can I see the B-roll, the other footage that was cut out? Can I see, you know, the emails from the producers? No, judge said, no, you can't see any of that. In addition to Daniels in the months leading up to the trial, Trump's former lawyer and prospective witness, Michael Cohen, he's been a regular on CNN. He's on there all the time. MSNBC hanging out with Jen Psaki, their go-to source for someone to deliver dirt on Trump. They just put him on the, on the, on the uh, air. Now, multiple times per week, Cohen also hosts a podcast called Mea Culpa, features a derogatory title about Trump to draw in audiences for virtually every show. For the court's convenience, here's a picture of his titles. Okay, here, let's look at these titles from Michael Cohen. He makes all of these statements Trump can't respond. Michael Cohen and Donnie Deutsch on Trump stock disaster and his criminal troubles. Can Trump respond? No, sorry. Forbes Trump analyst and Cohen sound the alarm on Trump stock scheme. He's getting good views on these. Cohen and Dem candidate turn the tables on Trump and MAGA. Lev Parnas tells Cohen more secrets from in tried Trump, some Trump schemes. Okay, list goes on and on. The guy has a whole career off bashing Trump and he's making a lot of money doing it. And so that begs the question about his truthfulness behind these beliefs. Now the court may take note of the 25 podcasts, they were created in just the past two months, months, past two months. He references Trump by name derogatorily. He runs for approximately one hour long each episode. He has hundreds of thousands of views on YouTube alone. The liberals love this guy. They're like Michael Cohen. He's my favorite. They go over to each other's, you know, houses for their, you know, dinners, eating whatever they eat. Did you catch the latest Cohen? Oh, he was so good. He talked about Trump again. I know, my favorite. Cohen's mea culpa also airs on Apple, Spotify, Google, iHeart, everywhere. It's difficult, if not possible, to quantify the full extent of his reach through his continual assault for profit gossip about his former client. It is noteworthy that the court never saw fit to silence Cohen or to even urge him to remain silent despite his status as an anticipated witness against Trump or, you know, the questionable ethics of a former attorney talking about their former client because Cohen got disbarred. Petitioners are not implying good logic that either Daniels or Cohen should be restrained in their speech. That's not the point, says Joe. However, the notion that neither of those expected witnesses are facing imprisonment, but they're permitted to ceaselessly peddle noxious perspectives of the defendant to their extensive audiences underscores the unconscionable unfairness of Trump being gagged. Now, while it's true that most criminal defense attorneys would likely urge Trump or any criminal defendant to be quiet and avoid discussing these people, good logic says that these perspectives does not merit significance in calculating the court's propriety of making a gag. And that's true. And I think that most people, criminal defense attorneys would also say, well, this is a unique situation. This guy's running for president and part of the defense is to win, to fix the corrupt system. Like it's not a legitimate prosecution, right? If Trump wins, it's going to be a correction. It's going to correct the entire DOJ and, you know, be a return to form of justice. And in order to, it, it, I'm pointing it, you can't just defend the, the single battle. You've got to win the whole thing, which means winning the presidency. So he has to prioritize these things. But the point remains. Now, fundamental fairness and constitutional due process dictates the court has no right to prevent Trump from responding to witness vitriol if he's so inclined. And finally, good logic urges the court to recognize the public policy and grant this. We are sadly, says Joe, living in a time where political divisions are dividing the country in ways few of us can remember. Says it's easy to mistakenly think 
that muting one whose words can be deemed grating is downright abusive is a healthy means of calming a storm, but that is a grave error. It says, kindly recognize the wisdom of the landmark court and their counsel about the inevitable backlash from stripping away our fundamental freedoms of speech and the press. It says, unenforced silence, quoting from Landmark, however limited, solely in the name of preserving the dignity of the bench, would probably engender resentment, suspicion, and contempt much more than it would enhance respect. It's kind of like a uh, you know legal interpretation of the Streisand effect. When you try to silence something, everybody listens to it. So Good Logic wraps this up. He says, okay, here's the deal. We are entitled to a restraining order and an injunction. As detailed, Precedent says that prior restraints on free speech, like the Trump gag, are faced with a heavy presumption of being constitutionally invalid. And so we have a high chance of likelihood. We also know that Mercan relied on flawed analysis of Landmark and Shepard. And the freedom of the press is offended by the gag order that he issued. If a prior restraint is ever available, it's not going to be when there's a political campaign and political speech. And if they're going to do it, you better have an evidentiary hearing to make a determination about whether this is appropriate. The court's failure to conduct an evidentiary hearing leaves Mercon's findings of fact way too hollow to justify ripping away someone's free speech rights. Now, the respondents, Mercon's fleeting review was a misapplication of the law, and it creates fundamental unfairness to Trump, muzzling him, turning him into a public punching bag when public perception may mean the difference between conviction and acquittal. And on that basis alone, Trump must be unchained from these gags so that he can speak in the arena of American ideas. If the petitioner's application is denied, we will suffer irreparable harm. And the balancing of the equities favors the relief that we're requesting. An, unplo- an, an unproven theory that Trump statements may or may not relate to improper conduct by unknown third parties, the dangerous speech, outweigh three definitive wrongs that necessarily resulted from judges' orders. One, you stripped him on the eve of trial of his most fundamental right of free speech, and they did that intentionally, and they incapacitated freedom of the press for petitioners and countless others who want to listen to Trump and his statements when he goes through trial. And lastly, and this one's for us, my friends, robbed every American the opportunity to weigh the words and the thoughts of the man that they will reject or they will elect in our impending presidential election. Saying the urgency is critical here. Every minute that Trump's First Amendment rights are obviated, and that good logics and all American civil rights are ignored, every minute evaporates and it can never be recaptured. With the looming New York trial scheduled to commence in any day now, we need to move now with uncommon exigency. Now, often our initial gut reaction is correct, but we outsmart ourselves. The very first words from Judge Mercan are right. He said that such restraints are the most serious and the least intolerable on First Amendment rights. We are at a precipice that is unique in American history. Good logic tells us a former and potential future president of the United States is about to engage in his own criminal defense. Kindly do not allow history to forever record that these unique proceedings were tainted by the foul stain of blatant disregard for Trump's First Amendment rights, as well as First Amendment rights of us, every American. And though, so therefore, good logic is therefore respectfully requesting that Trump's gag be reversed and that this court grant relief as appropriate. Signed by Joe Nearman. Good logic journalist, YouTuber, content creator, rumbler, localer, and all the things, a member of the press in New York 
And as far as I know, the only member of the press in the whole stinking country who filed anything of the sort who wanted to get Trump and his free speech rights back on track so that he could participate in the election. It's election interference for us not to be able to hear about the justice system, which is a critical electoral issue from the man who is on the receiving end of the biggest harms from the system itself. It is antithetical to the First Amendment. Every single journalist, every single media entity in the whole country should be outraged about this. And Judge Murkan should be made to be the laughing stock for allowing him not to speak in the name of administration of justice. It's ridiculous. This motion is amazing. Shout out to Good Logic and Joe Nearman and his efforts and everyone who was supporting his efforts. I know there were many people who were jumping in on this and lending a hand, including many of you who were over there at his channel, giving him the good energy and the good love. And so we're gonna to continue to do that, see where this goes. We will refer you over to his channel because he's gonna have the latest updates. These things move fast, very fast. And so he'll have the updates on his X account. I do believe he'll be streaming probably later tonight and continuing on. So make sure you're following him. Apparently the only journalist in the whole country doing anything about it. So we're glad about that. Shout out to Good Logic Joe Nearman on a good motion. We'll be continuing to pull for him so that we have access to free speech in America from a candidate who is running and leading in many of the polls. We'll be here continuing to cover this case and Good Logic's channels are linked down in the description below. His YouTube is, so make sure you go follow him on that one and send him our love on a great filing getting into the mix out there in New York. Very good to see it, and we'll be supporting him. So thanks for supporting him, supporting us, my friends. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe wherever it is you're watching it. We've also got some of our links down in the description below, our locals community, watchingthewatchers.locals.com. We have extra after parties as soon as the shows are here. We do live streams in the morning, and we have an amazing community. We'd love to have you join us. So come check it out, watchingthewatchers.locals.com. We'll see you over there and back here on the next one. All right, my friends. Well, that is it for us on the day. We got some good stuff we covered. Good logic, Joe Nearman filing in the New York courts to appeal. And of course, we are now getting up to speed, getting our pre-trial prep done as the Bragg trial continues to be scheduled for Monday. And we'll be covering that as well. And so now my friends, it is time to hear from you. Of course, as soon as we're done here, we are going over to watching the watchers.locals.com, our members only community. Come and join us. We do streams in the morning, streams on Saturday and after parties. We'd love to have you. Let's see, we saw some amazing super chats and donos come in. And thank you so much for these, my friends. Extremely generous and grateful for them. We've got, hey, a new membo, Neil. Neil AC is joining us. What's up, Neil? Welcome aboard. Great to have you as a new membo. We got JDE is here. Says Joe is something, but a... All right, we got this one from Tony Hay Munkets. What's up, Tony Hay Munkets? Bringing in 10 new membos, Mrs. Hayes. Rob J's coming in. G N Doc B. We got warning. Trigger. We got B train. We got Brandon H. Shindog is here. Mike P. Gerald Rogers. All gifted members. Courtesy of Tony Hay Munkets. Even more from Tony. Oh my gosh. We got two more from Tony. Belinda G. Dark Shogun. Nate R. Coming in. We got Prince V. Joseph Cash, Tony Haymuck gets bringing in five more and another five. Eddie Clay's coming in. We got Digga in the house. Josh the Commenter. We got Stuart M and Kathy T. Again, from Tony Haymuck gets, hey, hey, it's the Muckets. What's up, Brandy C coming in as a new membo. We'll see you tomorrow on the members only morning streams. Hey, Sandy's here. Sandy says, squash is awesome to grow. Let them grow huge at the end. Every five pounds of squash equals one cup flour once you dry it and grind and mill it. Squash of any kind is valuable. Zucchini is best if you plan to make flour out of it because they grow until you stop them. Oh, man. So if you haven't checked out my seedlings yet, go check out watcherlodge.com and click the news and stories 
and you'll see these are my little seedlings here. So those are uh, now working their way up. And here we'll play a little bit of it. You can see you got rosemary, chives, squash, cilantro, oregano, jalapeno. All right, you got to go over there. Go to watcherlodge.com to go watch me explain it all. All right, so check that out. Sandy, thank you for that. We're going to be growing like mad. And we got a vertical garden coming in too. It's going to be fun. Knox is here. Happy Thursday, all. Hard to find anything on Bragg prior to 2019, but he represented the family of Eric Garner, the man who was choked out for selling Lucy's in New York City. Interesting. I don't remember that one off the top of my head, but very interesting. Thank you, Knox. Happy Thursday to you, defense attorney in Texas. We got this one from Zone Girl. Says Cyrus Vance Jr. is the son of Cyrus Vance Sr., Secretary of State under Carter. Left in a kerfuffle over Iranian hostages, and they're definitely Democrats. It's certainly New York. Sandy says, all of these people screaming to get Donald J. Trump are fearful that they themselves are going to be arrested. The louder they scream, the guiltier they are. Yeah, you notice how they're starting to call this case the election interference case? Watch, watch for that. Watch them start to call the Stormy Daniels case election interference case because they need to make it mean something. Like it's, it's people don't buy it for anything. They say, oh, what was his election interference? Oh, it was trying to keep Stormy Daniel hidden. It's because they're in the middle of election interference. So they always call you and accuse you of doing what they're doing. So they're going to blame Trump for that and say he got, it's not a hush money case. It's election interference case. Just keep your eye out on that. Trevor Gale says, people read your Bible and you'll see that Donald J. Trump is modern day biblical Job from Trevelyn Gale. What's up, Dolphin fan is the man in the house bringing in Membo's dead fish cheese spread. Ah. Although, isn't some of that good? Some people might like that. It's like, kind of sounds like sushi, maybe. Hey, Beavis Jones is here. Grumpy Deplorable, Michael W. and Teresa W. All gifted Membo's courtesy of Carrie C in the house. We got Carrie C also bringing in uh, more Membo's. Did I already say these? No, I didn't. Carrie C bringing in HPK, That's Hot Air, Awesome Pursuit, BP Tangeli, and John D. So Dolphin Fan brought in Teresa Woke, and then Carrie K brought in these people. And Willow's Angel. What's up, Willow's Angel? Says, excellent breakdown of this bogus case. Thank you. Thank you, Willow's Angel. Hopefully it was useful. We'll get into some Michael Cohen and some Stormy Daniels tomorrow. Sandy says, the daughter connection of Judge Juan would be stronger if she were a minor. This is how corrupt people pay off people. They pay their children. You think it'd be stronger if she were a minor? I think it'd be harder to criticize her if she was a minor. I think the fact that she's an adult and they talk about this stuff and she's raising money makes her totally fair game. Yeah, Jennifer says, hey, great summarization in the first segment today, Rob. It sure is a lot of info to recall. I know, and I had to like squeeze some, I would like cut it for today because I couldn't finish all the other slides. I have so many slides that I need to work on. Sandy says, I do find it comical that the left insults Republican states as being incestuous while their relationships of power and connections are incestuous and they take showers with their young. These people are sick. You're right. Good logic, Sandy says, said he expected his answer to be within hours of the day he filed on the first come, first serve practice. The, de the, the delay responding to him, did they delay? I don't know. Yeah, responding to him? Good question. I don't know. We'll have to follow him. Something even may have happened while we've been here, you know, streaming. I don't know. So we'll have to leave it up to him. Carrie C. What's up, Carrie C.? Bringing in more Membos. You're amazing. Eerie Eclipse is here. Andy G. Good Logic is a Membo. What's up? Good Logic's in the house. Kitchen M. Kitchen Mortician and SMB. Maybe small, uh, medium business. I don't know. Cher says, could President Trump Talk about the business in lieu of talking about the daughter. Possibly connect the business with the judge. Yeah, maybe. I mean, the way to do that is through the daughter, unless there's some other person. But then what would the relationship with the judge be? You still need some connection to the judge. And I think the, I think the daughter's the best way, unless the judge is like on the board of directors or something. Bruce R. What's up, Bruce? Bringing in Ulysses, 
Lori's here, Dan Yu, Tissue Tech, and Heidi are all gifted membos courtesy of Bruce Rice. Thank you very much, Bruce, for being a membo and bringing in new membos. Sandy says, quote, this quote incite violence argument needs to be called out for what it is. If you tell people the truth, they will get so angry with us that they could come after us. Yeah, it's like, that's the point of the First Amendment. Don't be corrupt partisan hacks and we won't have anything to criticize you about, okay? Tron Man says, Trump needs to pick Vivek for VP before this trial so that Vivek can continue campaigning for him. I like Vivek. I think that would be great. I don't know that he would be the best political pick for the country. But for my, you know, political um, uh, preferences, you know, when he comes out and he's like, we're cutting the FBI down to nothing. I'm like, okay, that sounds good. All right. What's up, Vivek? Hey, Goofy for Jesus says judge wants justice. LOL. For who? Yeah, right. Hope that includes Trump. Stormy recanted this. Trump won a case against her. Why aren't witnesses gagged? This is crazy stuff. You're right. Because that would be that would be um, unfair to their team. They want to only win. That's all. Hey, what's up, Knox Beerman? And this is a great compliment. You're right about this, Knox. Says Joe is a great writer. Amazing brief. It's a good compliment. You're right about that. He is a great writer. He's really, really, very, very good. Joe is a sharp dude out there, which we already knew, but it's nice to see it confirmed in writing too. Joe is a great writer. Amazing brief. Knox is a defense attorney in Texas, so we know that's a good compliment. And the Rubos. What's up, the Rubos? Says, hey, thank you, Rob, for giving Joe good logic work what it deserves. God bless you abundantly. And here's a prayer from the Rubos. They have the best prayers. It says, here's one. We pray for Joe Nearman's success. Here, let's, let's make this full screen, baby. We pray from the Rubos. And they're at rubosaltshop.com. Just, you know, they didn't say that. I did. But it's delicious salt. And they're praying for Joe. They say, we pray for Joe Nearman's success in court for removing the gag order on Trump. Saying, for the Lord... Your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. Devarim chapter 24. From the Rubos in the house, lovely prayers for Joe. Thank you for that. From the Rubos, the best prayers as always. Amazing. Amen. We got this one from Salty Sarge says, Thank you for your efforts helping Joe and promoted these issues to save our republic. An inspirational song for the watchers. Fight the good fight. Triumph. Sounds like a good one. Well, look, man, Joe's doing good work. We're happy to be supporting him. Grateful to be a friend of somebody who's doing such cool work. We got kitchen morticians here. Se hey, seven months, man. Almost a full baby cooking in the oven over there. Kitchen mortician. Seven months as a membo. Grateful to have you. And hey, hey, it's the Monkets is bringing in another Membo. Jay Wins got gifted a Membo courtesy of Tony Hay. Very nice to see you, Tony Hay. And we got this one from Bruce Wayne. Batman's in the house. Says, fine job sifting through the pile of mendacity. Yeah, we have a lot of uh, noxious odors all over the courts. Fanny's noxious odor. We've got Mercan's noxious odor. Mendacity all over the place. And so, Bruce Wayne, thanks for being a member, my man. One third of the way there to that new baby. So, thanks for joining us. Let's see. We got some friends on X we're going to say hello to. And then we're going over to watchingthewatchers.locals.com for our members only after party to see who is joining us and what we got to debrief. We got some good comments in the house. Oh, what's up? Look who's dropping a chat. What's up? It's the one and only Julie Kelly. So if you're not already following Julie Kelly, I don't know what the heck you're doing. You should, because she's amazing. She says, I guarantee that Colangelo was all over creating the classified documents case. Amazing. So Julie Kelly was out watching some of that. Yeah. And yeah, so maybe he did that at the DOJ, then left, went over to Bragg. Guy's bouncing around all over the place. Liberty says every trial should be televised. Hey, Smith Skeeter says, Rob, awesome job on the PowerPoints. For the DAs and AGs, it would be awesome to see what cases they pursued, 
while serving these positions. Yeah, thanks for the feedback on it. You know, this is kind of like something that will mature over the course of the trial. You know, the slides will continue to mature and then we'll have a nice summation of how corrupt this whole thing was. It says, like DAs, AGs decide who to and who to not prosecute, right? Wondering if their prosecutions are one-sided. Yeah, it's a good it's a good question. I'll keep that in mind. I'll I'll think about a way if I can add stuff there. Hey, what's up? Lewis is here. Says can't wait to see how Trump cooked the books again, uh, or didn't. I guess Larry says states need their power back. Fred says you I, you can't imagine the smile on my face when anyone brings up the Trump indictments. I think you have no idea who you're talking to. Okay, I watch Robert Govea every night. I know more than the attorneys do. All right, we, we do go pretty hard here. We do go pretty hard. I was talking to my friend about the content. He's like, I was like, I was like, we go pretty like deep on our, on our content. He's like, the way he looked at me, he's like, yeah, you do. He's like, yeah, you do go like deep, like almost kind of like angry and disgusted. You know, he's like, yeah, like you do like a lot. And I was like, well, what was that for? What was that face for? It's important business. We're attending to it. Okay. So watch it. Hey, Cherry Pie says, thanks for keeping us informed. Thank you, Cherry Pie. Very nice to have you on the X. Uh, water the plant. It looks a bit sad. Uh, well, there's nothing growing in there. It, uh, on this one? I just planted them yesterday. They'll grow. All right, we've got, hey, what's up? We got Matthew Reed. Hopefully they grow. They better grow. Matthew says, I really don't understand about the entire case, everyone's hyperventilating over a campaign finance problem. Even if you assume that is a problem, Obama had to pay tens of thousands of dollars for campaign finance violations. Like that's normal. Yeah. Hey, Miss Skeeter, thank you. Awesome job. Thank you for that. Good comments. All right, my friends. And shout out to Julie Kelly. Make sure you're following her. She's right on our ex. Julie Kelly's doing a, a, incredible reporting and we love her work. So my friends, thanks for supporting us over on the X, following us out there, following other watchers out there in the wild and joining us on X. We are going to leave it there and head on over to watchingthewatchers.locals.com to debrief and see what's cooking over there. Don't forget, we got robertgovea.com. If you want PDFs, daily newsletter, show calendar, if you want to get some merch, that's where you'll go. We also have The Lodge on Saturday. We have our Sovereignty Saturdays. We're going to be talking about some new alerts that have come out from the FBI and other agencies. We got some gardening stuff we'll talk about, some food sovereignty and more. Come join us. It's free. We are building solutions to many of the problems that we're working through here. And so we'd love to see you join us. Watcherlodge.com. Links in the description below. Before we wrap it up, I want to say thanks to our mods and our meme smiths who mod down the fort for us and keep things nice and orderly. Our friends, Donut Mind Me clipping for us, Economy Pilot, we got Dog Digger, we have our friend Janek, Zach Nichols, Ronnie Cole, Playin' Hooky, Just Cause, and of course, K-Bean in the house. We also saw this one come in from Arnold Newton. Says the New York judge needs to recuse himself. Yeah, he's not going to, obviously. He, he should, but he's not going to. Trump has submitted a request, a motion for his recusal, but... I don't think he's going anywhere. So thank you, Arnold, for being a membo and for sending that last one in. Grateful for you, my friends. We also want to thank our meme smiths. We've got, of course, Sleepy Dog Lee, Nathan NA10, and Jigam Gigam over on the locals. My friends, that is it for us on the day. Tomorrow, we are going to be coming back here to see what else is in store for us. It sort of feels like it's the calm before the storm a little bit. Today was really dead in filings, like nothing. So I accelerated the PowerPoint, but almost nothing from the Trump defense in terms of new filings, which is a little bit strange. It's like they know what's coming on Monday. So everything is just getting ready for that. So we'll see what Friday has in store for us. We love a good Friday and we'll pick back up with flushing out some of the other components of this case as we gear up for the trial ourselves. And so we will be back here same time, same place tomorrow to get into it all again. And we need to see you right back here so that together with your help we can shine that big beautiful spotlight of accountability and transparency down upon our system with the hope of finding 
justice. Make it a beautiful night, my friends. Sleep very well. See you right back here tomorrow. Bye-bye.